In our last episode, we arrived at Klamath in search of the traitor Vic, only to discover that he had recently left to visit the nearby seedy town called The Den, and he never returned. But we found evidence in his home at Klamath that this is the same Vic who gave our tribe's people at Arroyo the relic from Vault 13. Finding Vic is still our best hope of getting the Gek for Arroyo. And so we travel southwest from Klamath to the Den. Thankfully, the travel isn't that far, so it's unlikely we'll be waylaid by bandits. We arrive at the northwestern side of town. It is, as we've been told, a horrible slum. We see people meandering around, crying in pain, coughing uncontrollably. Near to the front gate, we find a sandwich board, much like we did at Klamath. This bulletin board is maintained by Rebecca, who runs the nearby casino bar, but we find some graffiti scrawled on top. Becky is a whore, and her drinks are watered down. She's a crook and a liar. This writing is barely legible. Hmm, sounds like something that would come from an angry competitor. We find a posting for the Slavers Guild. The Slavers Guild is the best and only supplier of slaves in the wastes. This is why Sulik accompanied us, to see if we can find his sister who was kidnapped by slavers. The Slavers Guild is not selling slaves to the general public right now, but they are recruiting. Anyone interested should go and see Slave Master Metzger. There are two casinos and bars. Rebecca's, which boasts affordable drinks. It's the first building to the left as we enter town. And then Frankie's, which runs a bar and also a, quote, pleasure business on the east side of town. There's one restaurant, Mom's. She is on the east side of town, south of the Slavers Guild. And there are three shops, Tubby's, which is a chem and ammo shop. We'll find it just west of the bulletin board. Flick, which sells a variety of goods. His shop is just south of Becky's Bar. And then Smitty, a local mechanic who only rarely has things for sale. We'll start by heading to Rebecca's Casino Bar. It is, after all, the closest building, well lit with a big Becky's neon sign outside. Inside, we find a couple of craps tables. These are fully functioning gambling stations. We can use them to pass the time, or we can place some bets. Becky, the proprietor of Becky's, is standing behind the counter. When we ask her if she knows Vic, she says, yeah, I know him. Metzger has got him locked up. She's not sure why, though. So Vic is a slave. That's why he never made it back to Klamath. This Metzger has him locked up. Now we have to find a way to free him. But while we are here, Becky has a task for us. She says that a guy named Fred owes her 200 bucks. He's owed Becky the money for quite some time, and she's pretty much lost hope of ever getting it from him. So, if we can get the money from him, she'll be very grateful. Maybe that means we'll get a great finder's fee. Exploring Becky's casino and bar, we see a door behind the counter. When we try to open it, however, one of her guards says, back off. But just then, we watch the guard walk over to the dealer at the nearby table. Hey, honey, he says, can you pick up those dice again? I love the way you move. With his back turned, this gives us ample opportunity to pick the lock on this door. Inside, we find a staircase to the basement. While the guard is distracted, we can head to the basement. But we don't find much. We see a still in the middle of the room. So this is how Becky makes her liquor and a big pile of cardboard boxes. There's a door to the southeast. This leads to Becky's bedroom. Inside, we find a bookshelf, but it's empty. So for all that trouble, we walk away with zilch. Heading back upstairs, we can move south to explore the bottom room. We see a table covered in food, but nothing that we can loot, and a small shelf by the door that has quite a stash of consumables. With Becky's explored, we can cross the street to Tubby's. We read that Tubby's was the closest merchant to the gate. Inside, we pass a child. We find Tubbs behind the counter. Hello, sir, and welcome to Tubby's. I am the proprietor. May I help you? From Tubby, we learn a bit about the town's history. He says that the town has no leader. He describes it as an anarchistic place where a kind of Darwinian struggle is played out. Only the strongest, fastest, and smartest survive here. 
When we ask him about the chems we've heard are sold here, he demands a bribe first before he'll speak to us about it. We can try to threaten him to get the information, but that requires passing a strength check, and if we fail, Tubby refuses to do business with us ever again. We have to pass a barter check to bribe him with 50 bucks. If we fail, he says it's not enough, and as a last resort, we can give him 100 bucks. But all we learn is that chems act as the basis for the den's economic system, standing in for caps, money, or gold. He doesn't know where Vault 13 is located, but the name does remind him of a town called Vault City, which is apparently out there in the wastes. He doesn't have much more to tell us, however, because the people of Vault City don't really like to trade with the people of the den. He has a decent shop inventory for this early in the game. He sells a Desert Eagle, some 10mm ammunition, a small amount of chems, and has 260 caps to barter with. If we sneak into his bedroom, we can loot some alcohol and antidote from his dresser. Heading out of Tubby's, we can move south. When we enter the first building to the left, the guards inside say, you must be here to see Lara. Heading into the next room, we learn that Lara is the leader of this gang. She can't help us with our quest, but she does ask for our help. As a newcomer, she wants us to investigate a church just east of here. She has discovered that Medsker, the leader of the Slaver's Guild, has a bunch of thugs inside the church who are guarding something. She's curious and wants to find out what it is. For this simple recon mission, she offers us 200 bucks. If we accept, she says thanks but cautions us. Don't get in a fight. Yet, she has a plan. After accepting her quest, we can move to the southern room. In a bookshelf, we find a copy of Guns and Bullets, Three Flares, and a Crowbar. Heading out of Laura's, we can cross the street to explore this building just south of Becky's Casino and Bar. Inside, we find a bunch of peasants, most of which are just rambling and spouting nonsense. But in the southern room, we find a man in a green shirt. This, we learn, is Flick. He runs a shop of unique goods. Apparently, he has a strange accent. He greets us with a, Hey, der, I'm Flick. We can comment on this. If we do, he responds, What you talking about? You think I'm a stupid parla? Some dumb philo di putana? You think I'm some kind of clown? Am I here to amuse you? Is that it? Pretty defensive. So instead of highlighting this guy's personal insecurities, we can ask him what he does here. He describes himself as a provider, you know, like a good Samaritan. He provides for the orphaned children of the den. But we learned that he's really just a crook. He has the kids run all over town stealing from people. They then bring the goods here to Flick, and Flick will reward them based on the quality of the goods. In fact, these kids will steal from us if we're not careful. If we walk by a child and we see him do an opening animation, that means that he just rifled through our bag. The only way to get our goods back is to murder the kid or steal our goods back. All the inventory in his shop comes from purloined goods that the kids have found. And we see that they've found quite a lot. He sells a wide range of ammunition, leather armor, and another copy of Cat's Paw magazine. We'll go ahead and grab a copy, which will come in handy later. If, after being stolen from by a child, and we don't steal our goods back from that child, we can sometimes find our own goods for sale in Flick's shop. In which case, we can always buy them back from Flick. After bartering with him, he opens up, and we can have a conversation. He again tells us that Metzger is holding Vic captive. But when we ask about the vault, he says that he doesn't really know anything, but that Mama of Mama's restaurant might. We'll have to talk with her. Incidentally, Flick is a dastardly character with very evil karma. We don't lose any karma for murdering him. And in fact, no one in the den will get angry if we do so. And yet, if we kill him, we can loot his entire shop inventory. The stuff he's been stealing from visitors to the den. So early on in the game, he's a pretty convenient target to hit. Though it does mean we lose out on a merchant, a merchant which may be more valuable in the long term. Inside Flix, we have a chance to find Fred. We can also sometimes find him at the casinos. If we do find Fred here and we got the quest from Rebecca, we can tell him that we're here to collect. 
But we have a choice. We can say that he owes Becky $500, not the $200 he really owes her. Succeeding with this requires high speech, or we can intimidate him saying, head over the $200 or we'll brain you. But succeeding at that requires high strength. If we fail all of those checks, he'll say, sure, you're right, I owe the money, but I'm broke, I can't afford it. He offers up a measly 100 bucks, and then he has the gall to ask us if we'll spot him the other 100. We can say no, pay the full amount, now, in which case he obliges, but that completely guts the guy, or we can agree to cover half the fee. But if we do, he tries to push his luck further, saying, hey, you know that hundred I said I'd give you to give back to Becky? Well, that hundred's really going to delay things. He then asks if he can give only 50. We can continue to deny his requests until he finally forks over the 200 bucks. But we can say sure. And if we do, it catches him completely by surprise. He says, thank you, thank you. You won't regret this, I promise I'm good for it. So, walking away with only 50 bucks from Fred, we can head back up to Becky's bar and talk with Rebecca. We can tell her that we finally got the 200 bucks from Fred. She's so surprised that she says, tell you what, I'll split it with you right down the middle. 100 for me and 100 for you. So all in all, if we chose this way, we're only short 50 bucks. Now, if we convinced Fred to give the full amount to Becky, we walk away from the deal a hundred bucks in the black. But if we were kind to Fred, if we come back to the den between three and six months later, we discover that Fred struck it rich at the casino and he ends up being good for his word. If we allowed him to keep some of the money, he gives us a thousand bucks. If we were tough with him when we first asked for the money, he gives us an additional 500 bucks. And if we offered to cover the majority of his debt, he gives us 2,000 bucks, a plasma grenade, 200 small energy cells, and 250 microfusion cells. It's a bummer we have to come back so much later in the game to get it, but it's still quite a reward for doing so. We can turn away his offer, allowing him to keep all of this, but if we do, we only gain plus three karma. So it's overall just better to take what he gives us. Back at Becky's, as we're about to leave, we notice a blonde haired woman standing by the bar. This is Leanne, and she asks us to sit down and have a chat. She's been talking with the bartender, Becky, learning about Becky's family history, and then she asks us about ours. When we tell her that we're the chosen one and we are in search of Vault 13, it sparks her memory. She says this reminds me of a story, but she won't tell us the story unless we buy her a drink. If we agree to do so, she gives us some interesting lore that transpired between the events of Fallout 1 and the events of Fallout 2. After the death of the Master, the super mutants who survived were lost without any guidance. And so they began a great migration, coming from the south up north. Some continued north all the way up towards San Francisco, and some turned east, heading off towards Nevada. At the same time, there was another group who migrated from the same location. A bunch of dirty people in tattered purple robes, which we recognize as none other than the children of the cathedral. Some of the children of the cathedral had made it all the way up here to the den and were so distraught after the death of the master that they committed suicide right here in town. So a nice tie-in with the events of Fallout 1. And we gained 350 experience points for listening to the tale. If we go back to Rebecca for another drink, she tells us that she has another job for us. There's a guy in town named Derek, you see, who borrowed a book from her a long time ago, but he never returned it, and it was really important to her. She says that she'll pay us 80 bucks if we can get it back. The book was called The Lavender Flower, and we should be able to find Derek over at Mom's Restaurant on the east side. So we've got yet another task to complete. But before we do, we can finish exploring this side of town by heading south of Flix to the half-wrecked building at the very bottom of the map. As we approach, we see two children working as talking billboards standing outside this building. Come one, come all. The educational opportunity of a lifetime. See the Egyptian prince. See the queen of the Nile. See the ancient wonder. A genuine mummy. Here, now, mysteries of the netherworld revealed. 
Wow, they really did a good job talking it up. Heading inside, we see a man standing behind a coffin. We learn that his name is the Great Aninus, and he is quite theatrical. He offers us a slight bow and ends it with a flourish. I bring the mysteries from near and far, friend. Mysteries from a world beyond our own of the netherworld. He says that he knows things a mere mortal man is not meant to know. He has tales of a ghost that haunts this very building, and he can show us a genuine Egyptian mummy. <laughs> we can say, I've just got to hear about that ghost story. Uh, do you have a nice cup of hot cocoa to go along with it? And thus the tale begins. Well, you see, he starts and then he motions us closer. There was once a great queen that ruled all of the surrounding town. She kept her throne by virtue of a special amulet that she kept around her neck at all times. And it's here where the chosen one interrupts him, saying, Oh yeah, sure, you bet. So this princess had a magical amulet. Oh, do go on. I just can't stand this level of suspense much longer. With the jig up, he cuts his story short. He finishes by saying that an evil wizard poisoned the young princess and then took her amulet. She's been wandering around the very room next door to this one ever since, but only at the witching hour, which is why he keeps his door locked. After we express our incredulity, he says, but wait, you have yet to see the Egyptian mummy. The fee to see the mummy is a measly $25. After paying the man, we simply open the sarcophagus to gaze at the spectacle. But please, he says, no touching and no flash photography. Well, I don't think he needs to worry about that at this date. He grabs the lid with one hand and says, here you go, presenting the mummy. A crypt-like door swings open to reveal a genuine Egyptian mummy standing in an open sarcophagus that looks as though it's made of pure gold. But the Chosen One responds harshly. He says, That's a mummy? I can't believe I just paid 25 bucks to see a six-foot hunk of jerky. Goodbye. So the Chosen One didn't buy it, but if it wasn't an Egyptian mummy in the coffin, what exactly was it? We'll have to remember this for later. As he said, the door to the adjoining room is indeed locked, but there's a huge hole in the wall outside. Going outside, we can walk into this room. There's a shovel in a nearby bookshelf, but nothing else in any of the containers, and we don't see a ghost. Of course, it's probably just another tall tale from this shyster. But then again, he did say that the ghost only appeared at the witching hour. Well, we might as well come back at midnight to see what this is all about. But for now, let's move on. Near to this, we find a strange looking building. It almost looks like a bunker. And outside is a man in a full suit of impressive looking armor next to a strange looking winged symbol. Hello, Oxhorn, he says. I'm Joshua. What can I do for you? And we can ask him how he learned of our name. And even though this is only the third location we visited in the world, he says that our recent activities have drawn attention to us. People talk and people listen and word gets around. Never forget that you are only one small fish in an ocean of sharks, Oxhorn. We can urge him to tell us more, but he's reluctant. He says, let's just say that there's a lot more going on in this big world than we realize. And with that, he agrees to answer only one more question. If we ask him about the Gek, he tells us what we already know, that it was standard issue for most vaults, and it was a terraforming tool used to rebuild civilization. He thinks that we would only be able to find one in an unopened vault. If we ask him about Vault 13, all he says is, I've heard plenty of tales about Vault 13, but none of those tales told me where it was. And finally, if we ask him about Vic, he says that Vic has run afoul of the Slaver's Guild. We'll find him being imprisoned by Metzger. Good luck. And after that, he refuses to talk with us anymore. If we try to enter this bunker, we discover that the door is locked. Joshua warns us, that is private property. You better move along. We won't be able to enter this bunker while exploring the den in this episode, but later, much later in the game, once we've met a certain faction, we'll be able to come back to this strange man in this strange bunker and give it a thorough investigation. Now to head 
to the eastern side of town. On our way, we find a group of sketchy looking guys. You looking for trouble, they say? Talking to the guy in the leather jacket, we learn his name is Joey. What are you doing on my turf, he says. If we're belligerent, he and his goons start a fight. But if we're polite, he offers to sell us jet. But his jet comes at a steep price, 500 bucks per dose. Ouch. After declining his generous offer, we can ask him some questions. If we ask him about the guys at the nearby church, he tells us that it's a small gang run by a guy named Tyler. The crates that he's guarding came from Vault City. And sometimes these crates get shipped off to New Reno, but he doesn't know what's in them. Joey and Tyler here were once part of the same gang, but Tyler somehow betrayed them, kicking them out of a deal that he's got going on with Metzger. We learned that Lara, the woman who sent us there to check it out, has some bad blood with Tyler because of something that happened between Tyler and her brother. As we continue to talk with him, he offers to show us the location of New Reno on our Pip-Boy, though he warns us, saying that it's a very dangerous journey. Well, great, that was an informative pit stop. Moving on to the east part of town, we see the church to the south next to a graveyard and a building to the north with a big neon heart outside. A guy walks out talking about finding someone named Dave, who apparently has a bunch of great porn to watch. That's nice. Heading into the building with the heart, we learn that this is called The Hole. This is a combination bar and brothel. We can talk to the prostitute standing by the counter. Like the bathhouse at Klamath, having a <clears throat> group session costs more. We can pay $1,000 if we want to get down and dirty with our companions. If we do, the screen fades to black and we appear in one of the rooms. With the deed done, the prostitute walks off without much more to say. If we'd rather not waste that much money, we can instead talk to the proprietor, Frankie, standing behind the counter wearing a green shirt. The prostitute at the counter's name is Sheila. He just directs us towards her if we want women, and he absolutely refuses to talk with us. Information I do not have, he says. He's really only good for one thing, selling us whiskey. However, once we buy whiskey from him, he suddenly becomes much more talkative. But the prices of his booze are extraordinary. And we can ask him, why does your whiskey cost so much more than Becky's? And we learn that it's because he gets it imported from New Reno. The New Reno families charge an arm and a leg. He doesn't know how Becky sells hers for so cheap. We could tell him that he could try to find out. And instead, he says that if we find out, he'll pay us a hundred bucks. But we know how she sells her whiskey for so cheap. When we went into her basement earlier in the episode, we discovered that she had a whiskey still, and we can tell him that she has a still. He then offers to pay us 500 bucks to destroy it, and we can use his crowbar, which we can get in the back room. If we choose to accept, we can head back to Becky's and go downstairs until we find the still. Then, with the crowbar in our inventory, we can use it on the still until we demolish it. Heading back to Fred, we can tell him that the deed is done, and he gives us 500 bucks. Alternatively, instead of destroying the still when he asks us, we can say, I have a better idea. Just buy the liquor from Becky. It's cheaper than buying it from New Reno, so he'll end up making money too. But despite that logical alternative, he still wants the still destroyed unless we have a high enough speech skill. If we can persuade him to buy his booze from Becky, we gain 900 experience and 70 karma. Heading out of the hall, if we head to the bathroom behind the building, we find Becky's missing book, the lavender flower lying on the ground next to the toilet. This book is randomly placed in each game. It can be found in four locations, here where we found it, in the graveyard by the church near a tree, on the ground by some trees behind Metzger's Slaver's Guild, or next to a barrel by a rusted car just south of the graveyard. Fantastic, we can bring this back to Becky to collect our reward. But first, we'll finish exploring the eastern side of town. Heading south of the hall, we find the graveyard, but there's not much interesting here. So moving on over to the church, we find Tyler and his thugs guarding the door. If we try to open the door, the guards shout, Yo, Tyler, and immediately open fire. So instead, we have to talk with them, and they're very rude. Who the hell are you, and what do you want? 
We can lie and say that Metzger sent us. And if we pass a pretty easy speech check, we can say, hey, Metzger just wanted me to check on his stuff inside. And Tyler says, eh, just go in. What, does he think it's just gonna stand up and leave? Who would even want that stuff anyhow? Okay, so Tyler and his gang aren't very good guards. Heading inside, we see a bunch of Tyler's goons here. We can't talk to them, but they're not hostile. Inspecting the crates here, we can't look inside, but our Pip-Boy tells us that we see crates filled with various chemicals that are of no use to us. Okay, well, at least now we know what's inside these boxes. A bunch of chemicals. At least now we have something to tell Laura. Now, if we head east of the church, we find a peasant standing by a barrel fire. This is Derek, the guy Becky lent her book to. Now, we just happened to find it, but even if we talk to him before finding it, he's of no use to us. He'll say, yeah, I didn't like the book. Too much kissing. I threw it in the corner of that building. No, that building? No. Which building was it? Maybe I dropped it somewhere else. Or did I throw it? Ow, my head. He also rambles on about being a bread seller, but if we ask for some, he just gets angry and belligerent. So there's that. Just north of Derek is Ma's Diner. We find Ma standing behind a counter. Hello there, she says. My name is Mom and I run the place. Got the best food north of New Reno. We can say, you're not my mom. In which case she says, I know, but everyone calls me that. She treats everyone as if they're her own kin, as long as they obey her simple rules. No stealing, no cursing, and no fighting. If you do, you get out. She likes things peaceful here. When we ask her about our mission, she doesn't know of a Vault 13, though again, she says it reminds her of this Vault City, which must be nearby, and she also tells us that Vic is being held captive by Metzger. And it's not just Vic, he has all sorts of people locked up at his place. His place is just north of Ma's Diner. She then asks us if we'll do her a favor. She says, I need someone to deliver a meal to Smitty. We can find Smitty just west of here in a junkyard. She'll give us a free meal if we agree to. If we agree, she hands us Smitty's meal. After talking with Mom, we can chat with a woman sitting at a table nearby. Her name is Stacy. She says, oh, hi. We can say, why the glum face? And she says, oh, nothing, really. Just sometimes I get thinking about my mum and cat. I miss them so very much. We can ask her to tell us more of the story. We learn that her cat's name was Cuddles. But then she begins to well up and she can't quite finish the tale. She needs us to buy her a drink before she finishes telling the story. If we agree, she talks about how she used to hear stories about cats that were as big as you and me, big enough to eat people. Her cat was much smaller than these, and she describes her cat as if cats don't exist anymore. It's smaller than a dog, but bigger than a rat, and it made this wonderful sound when she petted it. She used to sleep with her kitty cat every night before going to bed, but then one day her cat disappeared, and she never learned why. She thinks that someone must have killed her cat and eaten it. Food was scarce back then, she says, and people used to hunt cats because they were easy prey. That's why we don't find cats anywhere anymore. They've all gone extinct from overhunting. She ends by saying, it makes me sad to think about it. And that's the conversation. So from this one person, we learned that cats are extinct in the Fallout universe, or at least on the West Coast. Maybe they weren't hunted as much on the East. But by listening to Stacy's story from beginning to end, we gain 200 experience. On the northern side of this building, we see a man in a green shirt sitting at a table. Spare some change for a <coughs> out-of-work farmer, he says. We can offer him a hot meal instead, and he goes, Oh, you know, I'm not really hungry. Uh, how about you just give me that money instead? We can call him what he is and say, you're just going to blow that money on cams. In which case, he doesn't want to talk with us anymore, understandably. But if we give him the 25 bucks, he opens up. We can ask him about the gek. But all he says is what? <coughs> gek? Yeah, that's some kind of lizard. <coughs> Never seen one, though. And we have to clarify, no, no, no. The gek, not a gecko. But he doesn't get it. He still thinks we're talking about geckos. After clarifying that we're talking about a suitcase-shaped device, he goes, oh, well, why didn't you say so? I know exactly where to find one. The Garden of Eden. Uh, uh. Then he falls flat on his face 
and passes out. We can't talk with Carl here again until he wakes up. Well, we'll have to remember good old Carl here and how fond he is of drink. Maybe he'll be helpful later. In the bedroom, we find a bookcase filled with booze and boxed foods. And that's it from Mom's Bar. Now, before heading to Metzger at the Slaver's Guild, we can turn in a few of our quests. Heading back to the western side of the den, we can try to deliver this meal to Smitty from Mom before it gets too cold. Passing the Brotherhood of Steel bunker on the north, we can go through a fence to arrive at a scrapyard that we missed earlier. Inside the shack, we find Smitty. Hello there, young feller. What can old Smitty do for ya? We can offer him the meal from Mom's, and he says, Well, that was mighty darn kind of you. In exchange, he hands us a stim pack. But we notice that he has a Corvega Highwayman parked just outside his shack. It looks an awful lot like the Corvega on cinder blocks that we saw at Trader Town in Klamath, the one Slim liked so well. And we recall that we found a fuel cell regulator sitting in the back of that ruined Highwayman. We can ask Smitty about this. We can say, hey, take a look at this thing I picked up in Klamath. He says that it's a fuel cell regulator and that it's used to improve the mileage on cars. Then he gets an idea. He says, listen here, I have this car. You see it right outside? That's a Chrysler Motors Highwayman. She's a beauty too. They used to say, nothing can stop a Highwayman. Built tough, that's what they were. Now he can get this running, but he needs a few parts, one of which is the fuel cell regulator that we found, but he also needs a fuel cell controller. If he had both the regulator and the controller and 2,000 bucks, he could fix up the Chrysler Highwayman for us and give us our very own car. This sounds almost too good to be true. Our own car that we can use to zip through the wasteland? When we ask him where we can find a controller, he says, that's a silly question. If I knew that, I'd be driving the car myself. So it looks like we have to keep our eyes out for a fuel cell controller. That's yet another tidbit that we need to store away for later. Now to deliver the book back to Becky. Heading inside Becky's bar, we can tell her that we found the lavender flower. If we examine the book before giving it to her, we discover that it's a torrid romance novel guaranteed to turn you into a seething cauldron of lust or put you to sleep. All right, well, I think I understand why Derek threw it away and why Becky wants it back so much. We hand it back and she gives us 80 bucks as a reward and we earn 300 experience. Next, we can head south to check in with Laura and her gang. When she asks us what we found at the church, we can say, not much, just big containers of chemicals of some kind. But this makes perfect sense to Laura, and she fills us in on the situation. You see, New Reno is the chem capital around these parts. They have to get their raw materials to make chems from somewhere, and it seems like they're getting some of them, or all of them, from nearby Vault City. She then asks us if we want to make some more cash. 50 bucks, easy money. If we agree, she asks us to check in with Metzger to see if he'd be okay if Tyler and Laura settled some old matters. She doesn't give us any clarification, but she says that he'll understand what she means. She doesn't want Tyler or his gang to see Laura or any of her men around that part of town. That would just tip her hand. So she needs us to play the role of a courier. So, heading to the east side of town, we can go to the furthest building to the northwest, the Slaver's Guild. As soon as we arrive, the guards warn us, don't piss Metzger off. As soon as we head inside, they stop us. Ah, fresh meat. Welcome to the Slaver's Guild. They buy and sell slaves, but sadly they don't have any slaves for sale at the moment. We can ask him about Vic, and he says, yeah, I know Vic. He's done for. He pissed off Metzger, and now he's royally screwed. But he doesn't have much more information for us. So heading to the northern room, we can have an audience with Metzger. What do you want, he says. This is the Slaver's Guild, not some house for you jetheads. We can break the ice by telling him that we have some merchandise to sell. We can point to Sulik. And Metzger says, another primitive, and this one's a real freak show. Still, he looks strong, and that might fetch something extra. He offers us around $1,700 for Sulik. If we say okay, the screen fades to black, and Sulik disappears from our party. They have him imprisoned in the slave pens to the north, and we walk away with around $2,000. 
Or we can say, hey, I'd like to join your guild. He says, are you sure that's what you want? To become one of us, you have to get a tattoo on your forehead, identifying you as one of us. There's no going back. If we agree, the screen goes black, and he says, what do you know? You didn't even cry. I'm so proud of you. Now that we are a slaver, we can go on slave runs. The slave runs work kind of like caravans. If we agree to go on one, the screen fades to black, and we arrive at some random tribal camp. The way this works is there are a few slaves who are hostile. Most of them just run around. Our job as support is to kill the ones that are attacking the other slavers. Once they're dead, the other slavers will run around and start tagging all the slaves. We get paid for the number of slaves that are shipped back to Metzger unharmed. But there are many consequences for becoming a slaver and going on these slave runs. For one, Sulik immediately leaves our party, of course because his sister was taken by slavers, and more than that, it locks us out of many of the quests in the game. We do, after all, now have a tattoo right on our face, identifying us as a slaver, and many people will just refuse to interact with us. So instead of selling Sulik, and instead of becoming a slaver, we can get down to business. We can deliver the message from Lara and say, Hey Metzger, Lara wanted me to ask you for permission to fight Tyler. And we learn exactly why Lara wants so badly to get rid of Tyler. Lara's gang and Tyler's gang are competing for the job to guard Metzger's chemical shipments. At one time, Metzger told Lara that if she could get rid of Tyler and his gang, then she'd be welcome to the job. But apparently at that time, she chickened out. But Metzger says that the offer is still open. If Laura and her gang ever defeat Tyler and his gang, they're welcome to the job. So Metzger gives Laura permission. With that information in hand, we can head back to the western side of town and tell Laura the good news. She asks us, what did he say? And we can say, he said yes. If you win the fight, you can have the job like you did before. She pays us our courier fee, but then says she has one more job for us. She says that at the moment, they don't think they can defeat Tyler and his gang. Laura and her gang aren't as well equipped, and they're slightly outnumbered. She needs some information on Tyler that she can use to exploit them. If we agree, we can head back to the church and talk to Tyler outside. When we ask him how things are going, he says, things are going great. A buddy of mine went it big at the tables and he's sharing the wealth. They're all going to throw a party tonight at his place and they're going to drink until they drop. So Tyler's going to be at a party, leaving only a skeleton crew behind to guard the chemical boxes. With our newfound information, we can head back to Laura. We tell her about the party and she says, great. That means they're going to have a skeleton crew guarding the church. That should be decent odds, and then they can hit the party after the church. Fine, that's great, but how about our money? And she says, not so fast. If you want the full amount, you have to accompany us tonight. So after all that, she's not going to finish paying out unless we help her in the fight. Now at this point, we can make a choice. Laura here has betrayed us. She was supposed to pay us for the last job, but she's refusing to unless we join her for another. If we feel upset about this, instead of joining Laura, we can head back to the church. Heading to Tyler, he says, what do you want? I need to get ready for my party. But we can tell him that we have some information that he might be interested in. If we demand money first before we tell him, he says, screw that, tell me, and I'll decide if it's worth the money. If we give him the tip, he offers us a hundred bucks. But before he'll pay it, he wants to wait until after they show up at the church. After all, he says, you could be lying. We can decline and say, but Tyler, I'm a lover, not a fighter. <laughs> and he says, I don't give a rat's ass what you are. I'm not giving you a dollar until after they show. We'll do the fighting, but you better be sure that they show. So heading back to Laura, we can tell her that we're ready for the battle to commence. We arrive later that night. She thinks we are working for them, but Tyler and his goons are prepared. Tyler and his goons easily defeat Laura and hers. When the battle is over, we can head to Tyler or any of his remaining crew, and they give us the $100. We can then loot the bodies at our leisure. Or, if we want to side with Laura, we can skip going to Tyler and simply tell her when we're ready. We arrive to find Tyler gone to that party. The only guard standing outside is Mark. We only have to kill Mark. 
If we don't enter the church during the fight, once Mark is dead, Laura and her goons waltz in, and we can loot the corpses. No matter how we choose to complete this quest, we still walk away with over a thousand experience, and however much experience we earned from joining in the fight. Now, since it's midnight, this is a perfect opportunity to see if that story from Aninus was true. Heading back to his room with the coffin, we can explore the ruin next door. And to our horror, we see a ghost. Oh, the pain. It burns so, says the ghost. When we ask her who she is, she says, I stop and knock at every door, but no one comes, no one hears. Now, if at any time we are snide or sarcastic, for example, if we say, I think you need to turn your stealth boy off, ma'am, she just moans loudly or says, oh, cruel fate. The only way to progress with her is to take her seriously. When we ask her what's wrong, she says, where is it? I can't find it. I am lost. Oh. When we ask her what she's looking for, she says, my locket, it's gone. Thief, thief. We can end by telling her that we'll try to help her. But in order to help her, we need to know the rest of the story. If we head to Mom at Mom's Diner, she thanks us for giving Smitty a meal, and in return, offers us a big combination plate. We can then ask her all sorts of questions. In particular, we can ask her about the nearby haunted house. She says, oh, I don't know much about that. Someone's probably just having a little fun, that's all. The haunting began about two years ago. She heard about all the moaning and the spirit sightings, but she doesn't believe it herself. When we ask her if anyone ever used that building around two years ago, she says, One of the boys used to sleep there a few years back. Maybe he knows something. He used to come by and pawn stuff. Jewelry, mostly. I remember a little gold locket that he kept for himself. Could that be what the ghost was looking for? When we ask her who the boy was, she goes, I'm, I'm not sure, was it Joseph, Joel, or something like that? He's almost 19 now, and it's a shame because she thinks he's joined up with some gang. But wait a minute, we remember a guy like that. His name wasn't Joel, it was Joey. He's the one who gave us the directions to New Reno. Heading back to the western side of town, we find Joey hanging out with his gang. If we confront him for taking the locket from the haunted house, he denies it. What are you talking about, he says. When we press the matter, he again denies it. And so we have to tell him that he stole a dead girl's locket and the spirit of the woman can't find rest. This begins to freak him out. He says, th th that's crazy. Y you must have been really messed up on some of Tubby's stuff. I never saw no ghost when I stayed there. What I saw was just a bad trip. Now, he's really sensitive at this point. If we try to intimidate him, if we demand it and threaten to hurt him, if we try to pay less than what he's asking, he and his goons become violent and they attack. We can always loot the locket from his inventory, but I found that any nearby townspeople would also turn hostile. So to avoid the battle, we have to agree to buy it off of him for 50 bucks. With the locket in hand, we can head back to the haunted house and give it to the spirit. My locket, give it to me. Oh, We can say, no way, go to hell, I found this fair and square. Which just ends the conversation. So the only way to proceed is to say, okay, here you go. My locket, my locket. I'm coming, daddy. I'm coming. And then she drops into a pile of bones. Examining the bones, we learn that her name was Anna. We find a pile of Anna's bones. We loot them and put them into our inventory. We now need to give Anna a proper burial. Heading to the graveyard, we can examine the tombstones in the graveyard to find Anna's grave. Starting from the right and moving left, the first one says, Colin McComb, another pointless life. The next one, under the sod and under the trees lies the body of Jonathan Pease. He is not here, there's only the pod. Pease shelled out and went to God. Okay, very clever. Love the rhyme. In the next one, here lies Lester Moore, five slugs from a 44. No less, no more. Okay, great. Are these all gonna be rhymes? In the next one, Tim Winkle, I abide no hypocrisy but my own. All right. In the last one, here lies the body of our Anna, done to death by a banana. It wasn't the fruit that laid her low, but the skin of the thing that made her go. Wonderful. 
Now, you'd think that that would be the right grave. It says Anna, and we looted Anna's bones, but no, it's not. The key was in Anna's spirit's final words before she departed. She said, Daddy, I'm coming. So we're looking for Anna's grave, which is likely going to be right next to her father's. Moving on to row number two, this is the headstone of Jeremy Barnes, the bald-headed monkey from Black Isle. All right, must have been someone who worked on the game. In the next one, here lies Donnie Cornwell, good and dead, in an extra-large coffin to fit his extra-large head. Wow, whatever priest buried all of these people was really a, um, uh, thespian. Next, Eileen Sa went to W&M Law School. Now it's Eileen Sue. Okay, we're really gonna read all of these. Moving on. The headstone reads, who was fatally burned March 21st, 1870 by the explosion of a lamp filled with R.E. Donforth's non-explosive burning fluid. What? Why? Why? And the next one. There are no markings on this headstone. Oh, okay. Moving to the bottom row. Mrs. Tamara Winslow. Okay, finally, they're starting to get normal. And the next one. Anna Winslow, there we go. But reading the rest, next to Anna's grave, Mr. Christopher Winslow. Okay, so she would have been buried right next to dad, as she hoped. Next to Christopher, Jesse Reynolds liked ginger snaps too much. And finally, Scott Campbell, not the soup. Ay, 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 the jokes. Well, now that we've identified the proper grave, we can head to Anna's grave, open up our inventory, and use the shovel that we looted from the bookshelf in the haunted house to exhume the grave. With that, the grave has been uncovered. Now, we need to access the bones in our inventory and use them on the exhumed grave. Once done, we then have to take the shovel and use it again on the grave to bury the bones. If done correctly, we get a message, the grave has been covered, we gain 600 experience, and we put Anna's bones to rest. So, ghosts are canonical in the Fallout universe, as is Campbell Soup, apparently. With nearly every quest complete in the den, we now have to get back to the entire reason we're here, to find Vic. So heading back to Metzger at the Slaver's Guild, we can try to ask him about Vic. Metzger informs us that Vic is now his property and he's not going anywhere. If our speech skill is high enough, we can convince him to allow us to speak with Vic. And we learn that Metzger had him enslaved because Vic sold him a radio that would be able to pick up transmissions, but it didn't. After selling him the faulty hardware, Vic tried to sneak out of town, but Metzger caught him. When we ask him what kind of transmissions he wanted to pick up, he says, the Enclave and new, but then he stops. It's my business, he says. I just need to make sure that no one's trying to screw me over. That's all you need to know. Now, he said that we can talk with Vic, but we see that Vic is imprisoned in a middle room to the right with a locked door. If we try to pick the lock, the guards immediately turn hostile. The only way to talk with him without turning the guards hostile is to head outside and sneak around to the eastern side of the building. There, we see a small window, and through the window, we can talk to Vic. He says, would you tell him I can't... Wait, who are you? You're not a slaver. What are you doing here? When we ask him why he's been locked away, he tells us what Metzger did. He's being held here until he can fix Metzger's radio. But the crystal's shot, and he doesn't have any spare parts. How does he expect him to fix it? Until he's released, he can't help us. We ask him about Vault 13, he refuses to talk. When we ask him where we can get replacement parts for his radio, he says that there's an old radio in his shack back at Klamath that has exactly what he needs. And that's right, we remember looting that radio when we visited his shack back at Klamath. And if we still have it in our inventory, we can hand it to him through the window. While Vic gets to work fixing the radio, we can head back inside to talk with Metzger. Only to learn that despite the fact that Vic has gotten the radio working, Metzger still won't let him go. To get Vic, it's gonna cost us a thousand bucks. Now we could always kill him and then just take Vic. But at this level, Metzger and his goons are formidable. We don't lose karma by killing them. It's just a really tricky fight. So instead, we've got to pay the cash. After paying the cash, we can head through the door and Vic says, thank you, I'm forever in your debt. What can I do to repay you? At last, we can finally get an answer. Tell me, Vic, where is Vault 13? Vault 13, he says? I don't know. 
There's a vault city east of here I trade there. But no, Vic, you had the water flask with the 13 on it. This water flask, it's from Vault 13. Where did you get it? And he says that he got it from Ed's over at Vault City. He's a Brahmin dealer. He was just one of my many suppliers. Vault City is not far from here. Oh, great. So Vic doesn't know where Vault 13 is. He got the Vault 13 flask from a guy named Ed. Doggone it. But at least it sounds as if Vic knows where Vault City is. When we ask him, he marks the location on our Pip-Boy, and then we can ask him if he'd like to accompany us. He says, sure, I'll join up with you. This old fart has one big adventure left in him. I'm sure of it. I'm pretty good at repairing things too, despite what Metzger says. And with that, Vic joins our party as our second companion. Surprisingly, Vic is actually one of the better companions in the game. He's a bit of a coward, we have to adjust his combat settings, but level him up a bit and give him a sniper rifle, and Vic can be deadly. With Sulik doing melee and Vic doing long-range sniping, we now have ourselves a formidable three-man team. Vic was right about being able to repair almost anything. If our repair skill isn't good enough, when we try to repair something, Vic, if he's a companion, will run up and repair it for us. At this point in the game, we can go back to the toxic caves and use Vic to repair the generator powering the door. But we still need an electronic lockpick, which we haven't found yet. But you know what? I can't abide these slavers. And so coming back much later in the game with a more powerful character, we can wipe them out. But there are still quite a few of them. So here's how I got through it. We can pickpocket each of his goons and remove all of their ammunition. This makes it so that they can't reload their weapons during the battle. Then we can lock all the doors to this building. They can't unlock them when the doors are locked, so we effectively split the entire gang into smaller, more manageable chunks. Then we can just plow our way through them one by one. By killing Metzger and his goons, we walk away with quite a stash of loot that we can sell, a whole bunch of positive karma, 1,000 experience, and if we check in with Becky back at Becky's Casino, she gives us a 1,000 bucks for ridding the town of Metzger's presence. With the slavers dead, we can head to the slave pens and free the slaves. This gives us a whole bunch of karma and 1,250 experience, but we don't find Sulik's sister. She's nowhere to be seen. That's because Sulik's sister was cut from the game. The developers had originally planned on having an entire quest where we would find his sister trapped in a pen and release her, but they cut it from the game. Now there are some unofficial patches we can install in modded versions of the game that restore some of this cut content, including the quest to find Sulik's sister. But I'm trying to show off as authentic of a Fallout 2 experience as I can, so I'm not playing this game with any of those mods installed. But there's also another possibility. The search for Sulik's sister was cut from the game, but it's strange then that they would leave Sulik's dialogue relating to her in the game. Perhaps this wasn't a mistake. Perhaps they did this on purpose. Remember, when we met Sulik in our last episode and he talked about his sister, this is what he said happened to her. One survivor. Dude was in bad shape. Said evil warriors came with magic torches. Fire would lick tribe warriors and they'd go to the spirit. The evil warriors tied up the rest and took off. Sis with them. Friend, we be finding her or die and trying. Evil warriors came with magic torches. Fire would lick tribe warriors and they would go to the spirit. That doesn't sound like slavers. Remember, Sulik just assumed that slavers kidnapped her, and therefore he assumed that the best place to find her would be at the den where the slavers were. A logical assumption since the warriors did tie everyone up and crate them off, but the slavers don't have access to big heavy weapons that could possibly be described as magic torches that spew fire. But what other faction do we know of that uses big heavy weapons that spew fire and also kidnaps people for their own nefarious purposes? Well, I don't know. We haven't met any yet. 
There is one final thing we can do before leaving town. Heading back to Ma's diner, we can once again talk with Carl. Remember, he was the guy who passed out when we tried to ask him questions about the Gek. Now that he is awake and has sobered up, we can ask him what his story is. He says, I used to be an upstanding citizen before coming here. I was a peaceful farmer that worked the fields as hard as any man until they started showing up at night, all glowing with pasty white skins. Spooked the hell out of me, it did. Night after night, they showed up and stole crops and cattle alike. I could do nothing to stop them. I know what you're gonna say. Why didn't you ask for help? I tell ya, I did. Nobody would believe me. They thought I was crazy. Finally, it just became too much for me. I gotta take it anymore. I just up and left and came here. And here I've been ever since. Carl then starts to weep uncontrollably. We decide to leave him with his misery. This is an important story to get. This is an important story to hear, for it might come back to us later at an important moment. And with that, we complete every quest at the den, defeat the Slaver's Guild, and rescue Vic. But we still don't have a Gek. Now, we have to follow up with the only lead that we have. We need to find this Eddie at nearby Vault City. I publish new Fallout videos each and every week, so if you don't want to miss that episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you have, but you feel like you're still not getting YouTube notifications, consider following me on Twitter at Oxhorn. I update Twitter manually with every new piece of content that I publish. I have a shirt shop with completely unique designs that you can't find anywhere else. My designs come on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. You can find them on other products as well, like smart phone cases, pillows, posters, stickers, mugs, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos.